in about half an hour's time, we're going to be looking at CNN and establishing a news habit on social media. Um, before that, a tremendous story from the Washington Post of increasing readers, increasing revenues, increasing profits. Uh, it's the kind of story we all want to hear about digital success. Um, and to tell us that story, please welcome the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Washington Post, Jeremy Gilbert. Thank you. It's a, a real pleasure to be here, and it's really exciting to be able to tell the story of the Washington Post right now. It's always more fun to tell a positive story. It's always more fun to tell a story when things are going well. And things have been going well at the Post for the last couple of years, really since Jeff Bezos bought us. And one of the most critical things that Jeff told us was he asked us about whether or not we were pushing ourselves hard enough in terms of our experimentation. And I think, at least for the post, this spirit of experimentation was really critical. And the way he posed it, I think, is very instructive. That he asks us, and still does, regularly, if we are going through a one-way door. And the truth of it is, almost none of our doors are one way. That almost every decision you can make, especially digitally, can be undone. And the question is, how painful is it to undo it relative to how much cost could there be if you don't go through the door. And so when we think about what we're doing at the Post, we think about the combination of the investments that we make, not just external investments, but how we invest our own time and our own resources in the products that we build with the culture that we want to create of continuous experimentation. And so far, over the almost three plus years that Jeff has owned the Post, that has led to dramatic increases in our scale, how large an audience we reach, dramatic increases in the depth of that audience. How deeply do they engage? Do they share our stories? Do they spend more time? Do they go on to a second story? And then that, in turn, has led to dramatic increases in our revenue. And really, at the heart of all of this is our storytelling. And frankly, there was no story more important than the 2016 election. And when we think about the story of the 2016 election, we think about a lot of surprises. Certainly few people in the United States saw Donald Trump's presidency coming quite the way that it did. And yet, even in the election, it was a very unusual election. And one of the experiments that we invested in was trying to tell the story of the election, not just on the channels we control. That obviously in the newspaper we deliver, obviously in the native apps that we create and on the website, we have ways of telling the story. But we also wanted to try to tell the story in ways that made sense for other platforms. And I want to give you a sense of how the post is changing in so much as we can now create, through video, the kinds of stories that you might have thought the, the election experience you might have expected from a cable news provider. And so what I'm going to show you is a little snapshot of what we created on election night. And on election night, we told our video story on our own website, but almost exclusively through Facebook Live. And this was part of our eight hour plus election live coverage. From your nation's capital and across the country, this is election night live from the Washington Post. Tracking every aspect of tonight's contest. We're here at the Javits Center. Things are really just getting started. It's turning into a little bit of a nail biter, isn't it? Thank you now to a panel hosted by my dear colleague, James Homan, Lee Powell at the Newsroom Hub. David Ignatius, of course, a columnist. Robert Costa. The crown was a dead giveaway. Matea Gold. She's the one that keeps track of where all the money is. Here. Mark Fisher, <laughs> co-author of Trump Revealed. Yes, those are big ifs. But he's in better shape in Florida than we thought. We go into Broward County here. We are nearing midnight. Several states are too close to call. We won't, according to John Podesta, see a concession speech from Hillary Clinton tonight. Donald John Trump is president of the United States. To be really historic, we have to do a great job. Be a challenging, historic, and interesting presidential transition and new administration to cover. I'm Ed O'Keefe. And I'm Elise Spivak. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Yeah, good night. Good night.
And what I think and I hope that you see there is that we can do TV quality journalism, but we can do it in a way that really makes sense for the web. What you don't see, and for social media, what you don't see is how our audience was able to interact directly with the people who were producing our show so that we could have interaction that went both ways, that it wasn't just a sort of TV style push, but actually a genuine conversation. And that wasn't the only experimentation that we did on election night. Another thing we did is that we pushed very hard to tell automated stories. That we knew that things had changed pretty dramatically since 2012, the last US presidential election. In that election, we had four journalists who worked overnight, basically writing off of the election results, and they were able to produce 15% of all of the election night stories. 15%. Now, you could argue that 15% is easily good enough to cover the important stories. But the challenge for the Post is that the Post had changed dramatically in four years, that we now saw ourselves as very much more a national and international news organization. And accordingly, we wanted to make sure that we told all the stories, because depending on where you live, your local race, whether it's close or not, is important. And so what we did is we built a system, an engine, that allowed us to take in data feeds and output stories. And it works a little bit like this, that we took in structured data, now, we ran it through our artificial intelligence system. And what we really did is we looked at the results. We tried to understand the results. And then we wrote into very dynamic templates that were changing depending on the numbers that we were seeing. And we outputted traditional stories. And what was really great about this is not only on election night did we save the work of four people. And those four people were only able to cover 15% of the stories. So we told more than 500 stories, 435 congressional races, 34 Senate seats, 15 or 12 gubernatorial races, excuse me, and slates of candidates. So all of the stories out of Iowa or Missouri or any of our states. Plus, we could talk about how all of the politicians funded by the Koch brothers had fared against all of the politicians funded by Emily's List. And so we could do this very different, much more specific kind of storytelling. But we also could present the information in a very different way. So one of the things we did, and email newsletters have become increasingly important to our business. It's a great push way of reaching people, is we gave you targeted email newsletters so that depending on the state you're from, and I live in the District of Columbia, that you can get very specific to your state or district's results. And we were able to do similar things on our website, where we were able to target different readers with different kinds of stories, all because they're powered by the machine. And so this is another different kind of way that we were experimenting in our coverage. And as I mentioned, social media is an increasingly important part of our lives, both in terms of distributing our stories, but also in reporting them. David Farenthold, one of the national reporters at the Washington Post, was following up on a speech that Donald Trump made very early in the campaign. He sat out one of the debates and instead said he was fundraising for veterans. He was going to fundraise through his personal foundation, the Trump Foundation, and he was going to give the money to veterans groups. However, after the speech, he didn't exactly say where the money was going. And David Farenthold is a pretty enterprising reporter, and so he decided he would ask a few days later, where did you spend the millions of dollars you raised? And the Trump team said, it's been spent, but we can't say where which is unusual. I mean, usually when people give to charity, they're often quite willing to disclose where that money goes, especially if they made a very public promise about raising it. And so he started investigating. And one of the ways that he shared his investigation is he started calling any kind of veterans group he could find. And he started documenting it on his reporter's notebook. And then he tweeted out each organization he called and whether or not they said they had received any money. Not to spoil the story, but none of them had. And then he started looking into other personal giving from the Trump Foundation. And what he discovered is that in some cases, the Trump Foundation had given, but they had given in return for something. In this case, there are two different portraits that Donald Trump had bought of himself with his foundation. It's unusual, but totally legal, assuming that it was not used for his personal gain in any way. So we asked, David did, where were the portraits? Well, they couldn't tell us that either. And so then David really started digging. And one of the things he did is that his social following had been growing, growing, especially on Twitter. And so he said to his followers, these are the pictures we're looking for. Do you have any idea where they might be? And sure enough, after a bunch of digging, one of the pictures surfaced in a TripAdvisor report about a Trump organization-owned hotel, which is not maybe as legal as it was to buy the picture as long as it wasn't used at a personal property. 
And another one was actually at uh, Mar-a-Lago, the uh, country club that he, or at Doral, excuse me, the country club he owns in Miami. And so in these cases, he, it was actually David Farenthal's Twitter audience that helped him do the reporting. And what's really kind of amazing when you look at it is the growth in his followers. So in the summer of 2015, he had about 4,000 Twitter followers. Not bad, but pretty small. And today it's more than 330,000. And those 330,000 people are not all helping him doing their reporting, but a lot are. And this changing relationship between our reporters and their social followings has really helped lead to growth. Because it's not just that we're asking our journalists to help distribute their stories, although they are. And it's not just that we're asking their personal social followings to help distribute their stories, although they are. It's that we're actually engaging with them deeply to help us with our reporting, to understand what issues matter to them, and to really help make our news gathering a two-way relationship. And what you can see is that has led to fairly large, this is domestic growth numbers, but fairly large growth. That when Jeff bought the post in October 2013, we were about 30 million domestic uniques, and now we're hovering right around 100 million. And, oops. And you can see also that our audience, and this is recent, our audience is also very different than when we started. That we have a much younger audience that in many ways is driven by the fact that far more of our audience comes to us on smartphones. That our younger audience members are much more likely to use a smartphone. And when Jeff bought the post, we were about 60-40 desktop to mobile, and now we're about 80-20 mobile to desktop. So there's been a very big switch. But what's interesting is that switch hasn't led to decreased engagement. You might expect lower engagement numbers when people are on smartphones, and that really hasn't held true. The other thing is we have been able to invest very heavily in our own newsroom. That this year we got about, well, more than 60 new hires within the newsroom alone, and it's allowing us to cover a lot of things that we wouldn't have been able to cover before. We're launching a millennial women-focused version of the Washington Post. We're investing heavily in our international coverage. We're nearly doubling the size of our video team. We, are, we have begun licensing our technology, the content management system that we use. We're pushing very heavily in audio. We're increasing the size of our investigative team. We're doing more breaking news. And we're obviously covering politics and leadership in ways that we have not covered before. And in many ways, this goes back to a philosophy that Jeff imparted on us early. Which is, he said, if I understand your business model correctly, you spend months at the time investigating a story, reporting on it, thinking about it, figuring out how you're going to write it, and then within 15 minutes, all of your competitors can copy that same story and post it themselves. And we said, no, 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 that's not, that's not totally, it kind of is, actually is true, but we could do that to them too. And he was not very impressed by that. And he said to us, what is it you do do that can't be copied right away. And we had to think about that for a while. And what it came down to is that our most visual, our most multi-sensory stories were the hardest to copy. They're the ones we had spent the most time thinking about what the storytelling experience was like, and they were the most unique to us for the longest period of time. And so that's led to some very major investments, but it's also led to much deeper engagement with our audience. You can see that we've nearly doubled the amount of time spent by our audience. And we're pushing into new storytelling forms. So about four weeks ago, we launched our Snapchat Discover channel. And although it is very non-traditional video, it's still video storytelling. Often it's motion graphics. There's still the same depth and quality, we believe, to our storytelling, but it's told in a very different, highly visual way. And we've also started to think very deeply about audio and where audio can take us. You've heard a lot about the value of the Alexa and the Google Home and these interactive audio platforms. This is something that Post is investing very heavily in. We're also investing very heavily in what we can do with podcasts that for a company that does not own radio stations, does not own TV stations, the opportunity to go from being a primarily text-based legacy news organization to one that releases our own audio is fantastic. The Can He Do That podcast debuted about a week and a half ago in the, um, I'm sorry, almost a month ago in the iTunes store, and is now doing almost a million downloads a month. That we're having real scale from a show based around the question, is the president allowed to do something? And we're even transforming our existing stories. One of the things that we've noticed is that if we really want to drive engagement with our long-form storytelling, and this is an example of a story that was about 5,000 words that had embedded audio and video, that we need to help our audience. 
that they are so likely to encounter many of these stories during the day on social platforms when they're on their phone and they have the least amount of time that we need to help them shift time and place and device. And so when we notice and we're tracking your scroll speed and we're looking at both on mobile and desktop how deeply engaged you are, whether you're reading or watching or listening, if you pause, then we're asking if you want to continue the story later. And when we do, we're sending you an email that doesn't just ask you to come back to the story later. It actually picks up right where you left off reading. And it tells you, here's what you just read, here's what's coming up, and only then does it give you the, the action to jump to the story. And what we see is this whole story had about 11 minutes of engaged reading time. But people who received the email spent about 17 minutes with the story, which means they read nearly everything. Given that our site does about 20 minutes of, of time per month with our users, 17 minutes for a single story is pretty incredible. And so some of our job is to transition people from when they would normally encounter the stories to when they actually have time to spend with them. And we're also looking at all kinds of new tappable ways that we can engage people in our storytelling. This is a story about barriers, about walls around the world. And what you can see is there are lots of ways to interact with the story. You can tap into the videos for audio. You can interact with the graphics. And in this particular case, it was a multi-part story that was rolling out across three days. But we wanted to give people who read to the end of a single story a gift. And the gift we gave them in this case is a, a, a sneak peek, a look ahead at the next story. So that if you were willing to read this entire story, we would take you into the second story, even if we hadn't published it for everyone else. And what we saw again is this kind of thing incented people to read deeply, incented people to share, because they believed that they had seen something that other people hadn't gotten. and was really powerful. And we are doing a lot of experiments where we know there might not yet be a lot of scale. One of the things we're looking at this year, so we published last year our first virtual reality story, our first augmented reality story, is we're going to do a series of augmented reality stories. But instead of just publishing them, we're going to pu publishing them separately, asking you to download an app, have a wholly different experience. We're going to publish them inside our existing mobile app, where we have a built-in audience. And this is the first, this is a prototype of the first story, which is actually about the uh, Philharmonic that just opened recently in Hamburg. And so first, you select the story that you want to read. And one of the things that makes the Hamburg Philharmonic so different is the unique acoustic tiles in, in the, the hall. And each one is designed by algorithm and is, is sort of unique. Each one is different. And so what we want to do is we actually want to be able to paint the space around you, your floor, your wall, your table, your hand even, with these acoustic tiles. And this just takes you to the point at which the story really begins, which is to say, then we're going to show you how those tiles work, how the sound bounces off of them specifically, and what makes them absolutely unique. And um, in general, the thing that I am most proud of at The Post right now is our ability both to do serious and compelling journalism, but also to do technical experimentation, to push the bounds of what's possible. And I think our executive editor, Marty Barron, summed it up pretty well what our challenge is right now. The way I view it is that we're not, we're not at war with the administration. We're at work, okay? We're doing our jobs. And so that's how we're thinking about things at the Post right now, is uh, although the political climate may be challenging for a free press, we're, we're doing our jobs. And uh, our job requires both experimentation and great journalism. So thank you. Will you take a question? Sure. Great presentation, um, and I'm sure we have some questions, so do raise your hand if you do have one, and we'll take it right now. Uh, traditionally, I'll always start with one while the audience sure. uh, gets themselves uh, into the right frame of mind. Um, so Jeff Bezos took over the, the paper. There's a long tradition of wealthy individuals buying papers and then saying, you know, don't worry about making a profit, because this is a, like a personal thing for me. You guys just innovate and don't worry about it. Is that what's happening, or is everything we've seen still driven by a bottom line need to deliver profits? Well, somewhere in between, honestly. So Jeff Bezos expects the Post to be profitable. He wants the Post to be profitable, not because he needs a particularly profitable business from the Post, but because he wants us to be independent. And part of the way for us to be independent is to be profitable, to be a successful business. Uh, I would say we were profitable ahead of schedule. So we were profitable for the first time in about 10 plus years last year, and we plan to be profitable again. That we believe great journalism will lead to people paying directly for content for advertisers wanting to appear near it. 
Okay. We'll take uh, one more question if there is one. There's one at the back of the room there. Our microphone sprinter is on the way. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jeremy. Rasmus Nilsson from the Reuters Institute in Oxford. Um, can you tell us anything about how you think about the relationship between the Post and the platform companies as you look towards the future? Right now, the Post is pretty committed to experimenting on a lot of different platforms. Part of that is for the first couple of years, it was absolutely critical for us to grow the overall size of our audience. How many people saw us, met us, re-engaged re with our content? We want to be on as many of those platforms as possible as long as it is in our economic interest and as long as it fits our long-term strategic needs. Just like the one-way door analogy, we'll stay on those platforms as long as it makes sense. And if it ceases to make sense, if we believe it is hurting the size of our overall audience or it's costing us revenue, then we'll rethink our decision. Right now, a growing audience seems to be leading to a growing number of directly paying subscribers and seems to be leading to stronger digital advertising revenue. And so for those reasons, we're on those platforms. But if it stops, then we'll stop. Okay, so are there any more questions before I ask you to uh, thank Jeremy Gilbert? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Cheers. Thank you.